And if you do have a Bible, we'll be in Psalm 37, as I read earlier. If you're a guest with us this morning, welcome. My name is Steve, uh, one of the pastors. Pastor Lauren is teaching a, a workshop right now on the other side of those doors. And uh, I get to open the word with us this morning. So we're going to be in Psalm 37 today, uh, starting next week. This will be the last psalm that we do. We've done a few over this summer. Starting next week, we're going to jump into our sermon series for the fall. We're going to be looking at the books of First and Second Thessalonians. The name of the series will be In the Meantime, looking at what it looks like to live faithfully now as we await the Lord's return. And so if you want to get ahead on that, I'll read First and Second Thessalonians this week. We'll start that series next Sunday, and that'll actually take us all the way up until uh, just about Christmas time, a couple weeks before Christmas. We'll do a Christmas series, and uh, that's, where we're, that's where we're headed, just so you know. Um, but today, we're going to do Psalm 37, and the title of the sermon is this, When Good Things Happen to Bad People. And I immediately know what some of you are thinking, because they looked at me weird in the first service, too. They're like, Steve's been on vacation, it's Labor Day weekend, and he screwed it up. He got it backwards, right? Because we always talk about, like, when bad things happen to good people, and that's like one of those objections that non-Christians have toward Christianity and people who don't know or love God would have toward Christianity is like how could how can bad things how can God allow bad things to happen to good people but did you know that the converse is actually one of the primary reasons that people who are Christians uh, or who profess to be Christians turn away from the faith Seeing good things happen to bad people, or as scripture calls it, the prosperity of the wicked. In other words, why is it that it seems like I follow God and I follow his word and I follow his will and hard times happen and persecution happens, yet I see a coworker, or a family member or a neighbor or someone else or I open my social media account or I read the news and it seems like bad people are using bad things and good is happening to them. They're, they're prospering. Why is it that sin sometimes seems to pay off? And that's a, a great objection that many people have to God and his word. In fact, you may know someone who turned from the Lord, who, who was following the Lord and turned away from the Lord because they saw good things happening to bad people. They saw the prosperity of the wicked, the prosperity of secular people. And the question for us then is, how do we respond when good things happen to bad people? When it seems that people who are sinful seem to be prospering when wickedness seems to be winning and sin seems to be paying off how do we respond that's what psalm 37 is about and if you're looking at it and you know my proclivities this morning and you're like there's like 40 ish verses this is going to take us all day we're only going to do 1 through 11 can i get an amen come on we're going to do Psalm 37, 1 through 11. And in those verses, I want us to see three specific ways that we should respond when we see prosperity of the wicked, when we see bad thi good things happening to bad people. How should we respond? And so we'll break it down this morning. In verses 1 and 2, we're going to see uh, the first really important point. This is really going to resonate with some of you. Don't freak out. Do we have some freak out people here this morning? Who would be willing to say, I'm a freak out person? The early service, that's okay. You can kind of put your hand up a little. I get it. I can see you. Some of you are loud and proud. Listen, you ask my wife. You ask my kids. I can tend to be a freak out kind of guy, right? Stuff happens. Something bad goes down. I can tend to be a freak out kind of guy. And we need the message regularly like, relax. Don't freak out. Don't go crazy. It's all right. Psalm 37, 1 and 2 says, when you see good things happening to bad people, don't freak out. Take the long view. 37.1, fret not yourself because of evildoers. And that fret not idea is going to come up three different times in verses 1 through 11. We'll get to the rest of them in a little while. But the idea here of fret not, some of you are like, oh yeah, fret. I totally resonate with that. When you think about fret, you think about like, you know, something happens and you're in the corner in the fetal position. Like, no, please, why? Right? The idea behind the Hebrew here is the idea of having a hot anger. When it says fret not because of evildoers, it's the idea of having a, a strong, uh, a hot anger, being very angry. And, and here's what's going to happen for some of us. It, it's, it's real easy to have emotional responses when we see these things happening. 
When you open up your social media account and you see what seems to be someone celebrating a sinful lifestyle and being happy and getting away with it and even prospering because of it. When you go to work and somebody, the sleazy guy at work gets the promotion and you don't, there's going to be some emotional tendencies that we're going to have. Whenever we see this happening and we see bad people and we see good things happening, there will be a couple of emotional tendencies. And for many of you, your emotional tendency is going to be anger. And here's the problem with that. You're going to justify your anger by saying that it's righteous anger. Well, Jesus got ticked, and he kicked over those tables, and I'm going to work, and I'm throwing stuff. And Jesus did it, so so can I. Right? Is that going to fly with your boss? It might. I mean, I'm not sure where you work, but, you know, it wouldn't fly here. I can guarantee. I got a lot of bosses. If I throw things on Monday morning, not pretty. But some of us will have the tendency to like get angry and mad, and then we'll think, well, that's righteous, that anger, because what I'm doing is like I'm mad at their sinfulness. Here's what this text is talking about. It's talking about unrighteous anger. And the difference between righteous and unrighteous anger is important. When Jesus did all that stuff and flipped over those tables and all that, you know what he was mad about? He was mad about what they were doing to the name of God. He wasn't mad about like his own personal finance that was involved in that. He was mad about what they were doing to the name of God. The difference between unrighteous and righteous anger is its motive. Righteous anger is I am mad and I'm frustrated about what you are doing to the name of God. Unrighteous anger is I'm just mad that I'm not getting what I want and you are getting it instead. And many of us will tend toward unrighteous anger when we see these people, wicked people, bad people, getting good things. It says, fret not because of evildoers. And then he says this. He says, be not envious of wrongdoers. Because you know there's another emotional response that we have sometimes when we see people sinning and getting away with it. When it seems like sin is paying off, when it seems like people are being disingenuous or dishonest and, and getting paid for it, there's another response. And that's the response of jealousy. Like maybe you've had that time when you're looking at that other person and, and you're looking at your life and you're like, I, I'm trying to live for the Lord and I'm trying to honor my marriage and I'm trying to honor God's word and I'm trying to honor my children and, and it's tough. And, and you're going there and then you're watching a friend who is not honoring their marriage and not honoring the Lord and doing everything but doing that and they seem to be happy and they seem to be prospering and it seems to be going well for them. Is there not sometimes that time where you stop and you think, hmm, I wonder if life's actually better over there? That's one of the things that, that tends to like pull people away from following the Lord and move them toward following not the Lord, far from the Lord. As we see the life, and I've, I've heard this excuse so many times, but I'm just not, like, like the word of, of our culture today, I'm just not happy I'm following the Lord, and I'm doing these things. I'm just not happy. But I, over here, I feel happy. Right? And that can pull us away. And he says, don't be envious of wrongdoers. But why? Verse 2. For they will soon fade like the grass, and wither like the green herb. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to, to go up into the mountains during wildflower season. But it's a beautiful thing. You can, some places you can actually drive there, which means that a lot more of us should be like, interested in it, right? And you get up into the mountains and it's wildflower season and it looks like God just put out an amazing carpet and there's not even weeding. Like you don't even have to use weed killers. And it's beautiful and it's amazing. And we've spent a lot of time in the mountains seeing that as a family and we love it. But you know what happens if you show up like a week late for wildflower season? Like, there's this really short period of time, and people who are hikers know this. You're on the Washington Trails app, and you're on different— because it kind of comes and goes depending on the weather, and it can come and go really quickly. And people are watching, and they're trying to figure out when is what peak wildflower season. And you'll see somebody on the trail app, and they'll say, it's here, it's now, get up here. And you can't get up there for three, four days, and then you go up, and it can be just, like, gone. Because it just withers in no time. And those flowers are beautiful and amazing for a week or a couple weeks. But if you get up there just too late, withered. In the same way, maybe some of you have like gone on vacation and forgot to water your flowers. Anyone? No? Okay. Right? And you realize like if you go on vacation and you don't water your flowers, what are you probably going to come back to a week later? Right? Dust. That's a lot of money for dust. 
I see the smiles. I get it, right? Been there. But these things are fleeting and temporary, and that's exactly the picture that David is writing about here. They will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Taking the long view means that we have the ability to discern between the immediate and the ultimate. And it's interesting, right? Because sin is fun. Like, wait a minute, what? You said that out loud at church, right? Teenagers, I need you to, like, really get that. Like, sin is fun. People aren't practicing sin because it's, like, somehow boring and not fun. And and people aren't walking around in Vegas like, ooh, this is disgusting, but I can't help doing it anyway, right? Sin is fun for a season. We lie to people if we're like, no, it's not. No, sin is fun for a season. And sin can seem prosperous in the temporary, in the momentary. Like that guy might get that promotion. That gal might get that boyfriend or relationship that she's always wanted. Whatever it is. But it's so fleeting and so temporary. Taking the long view means that we're able to discern between the immediate and the ultimate. And that we're able to put off momentary pleasures in lieu of delayed gratification. Right? Instead of chasing momentary pleasure after momentary pleasure after momentary pleasure after momentary pleasure, there we'll be, we're able to take that and set it aside and say there's something better and something more important called delayed gratification. It's like eating cotton candy versus eating a good steak. Right? Y'all are cotton candy fans? Cotton candy is good for a moment. I know you guys. Yeah, yeah you are. Good girl. I'll get you some later. Right? <laughs> cotton candy is good temporarily. But you try to live your whole life on nothing but cotton candy. How are we going to do? We're going to have problems quick, aren't we? But you take an amazing steak, maybe put a couple of veggies in there just for fun and color, right? And that's the stuff you can live off of. Delayed gratification. But when good things are happening to bad people, we have got to stop freaking out and start taking the long view. Verses 3 through 7 gives us a second response, and it's this. I think it's this. Are we on up there, you guys? Send them up there. Give me the next one. I think my thing broke. Or the computer broke. There it is. Number two, redirect your affections and then let God redefine your life. Redirect your affections. Let's talk about that for a minute. There are four key verbs. I'm going to point them out briefly and talk about them here because it's talking about the things that we love, the things that we care about. Verse three says, trust in the Lord and do good. Verse 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord. Verse 5 says, commit your way to the Lord. And verse 7 says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. So you have trust, delight, commit, and be still or rest. And let's look at those in turn because each of those words are about our affections. They're about the things that like matter to us and the things that we care about. And it's like this, trust, trust in the Lord and do good. We talk frequently about what it means to trust God. We use phrases like let go and let God. We went on vacation last week. We were on vacation, and I had an opportunity to experience this firsthand. So um, one of the things that they had available for our family was a rock climbing wall, which rock climbing walls are pretty cool. And back in the day, I used to do some rock climbing. Now, that was many years ago. In addition to many years ago, it was many, many pounds ago. And so, like, I would take youth group kids, and we would go rock climbing, and we would use a system called a belay system where I would stand with a harness, and I'd have a rope, run it to the top of the climb, and back down to another harness that had a kid in it, and they trusted me with their lives, and they would climb, and I would belay them, and if they fell, then they were perfectly fine. And when I climbed with my friends, we did basically the same thing, and there were two people, and you were entrusting your lives to each other. So we get to this rock climbing wall, and I thought, the girls are like, Dad, let's go rock climbing. I'm like, yeah, that's right. Let's go rock climbing. This is going to be amazing. You're going to see how manly your dad still is after all these years, right? And so we get over there to the rock wall, and there were like a bunch of people that were there, and most of them were like young girls. But there were a lot of like people standing around waiting to get in line. I thought, like, I'm one of the only adults here. Is that weird? But okay, I'm with the girls. Let's do it. And so there were the ropes that were there, and I thought, this is great. They gave us the shoes, gave us the harnesses. There's the rope. One of these big, strong men is going to come and belay me, and this is going to be fine, right? The wall is like 350 feet tall. Not a problem. Okay, it wasn't quite that tall. 
then there was this other thing hanging on the wall that I'd never seen before at the top of the wall. And it looked like a big fishing reel with like a rope coming out of it with a carabiner on the end. And I'm like, I wonder what that's for. Oh, it's probably like extra protection so they don't get sued. Not, not a bad idea, right? In case the guy falls asleep and drops me, then that thing. So I go, and I stand in there, and my daughter's standing next to me, and the guy comes over, and he just grabs the rope that's attached to the fishing reel and hooks it onto me and turns around and says, okay, you're good, and then does the same to her and then walks off. And I'm like, wait, what, what just happened? Where's he with the rope and all the stuff? And like, you know, and I'm like, are we good to climb? And he's like, yeah, go ahead. Okay, they probably wouldn't do anything that would get me killed, right? Because then my wife would sue them. So this is probably safe. But I've never tested this gear. I'm going to put my life in the hands of this fishing reel up here and there's no other person up there like pushing a button saying like catch this idiot when he falls because he shouldn't be doing this anyway because he's too old and overweight so i start climbing and i'm at 10 feet up the wall and the daughter who's climbing with me says dad like you know she kind of questions will this thing catch us and i'm like babe i'm sure it'll catch us watch and i like fell backwards to show her onto the ground <laughs> literally fell on the ground it was awkward, embarrassing, little kids around, you know, a bunch of eight-year-olds. Like, what's that grown man doing? He should know better than being up there at all. And I'm like, there's a problem here, because i got to climb a lot higher than 10 feet with this. But she's watching, they're all watching, and I'm like, I guess i got to man up. Why didn't that thing catch me? So this is in my mind, and I start climbing. And I get like three-quarters of the way up this wall, and there's, I start to have what we would call trust issues, Right? And I'm three-quarters away from this wall, and I look down, and we're on a boat, so we're not, like, on land. We're on a boat, and so there's, like, the edge of the water over there, too. And I'm like, this could go bad in a lot of ways. And I started to do that thing. You know that thing? Doubt. And I'm hanging on the wall. Again, many pounds more than the last time I hung on the side of a wall. And I'm hanging there, and I start to doubt. And instead of just climbing and getting up there, I'm like, what if I fall? What if it doesn't catch me? It didn't catch me last time. Is this thing going to work? There's not a guy for me to yell. What am I doing? And as I'm climbing, my daughter's obviously climbing higher than I am because she's smarter than me. And so she, like, is done. And I'm like, good job, honey. Ah. And I'm climbing. I'm, like, three-quarters of the way up. And I, I look down. You don't look down, do you? No, you don't look down, you dummy. I look down. And my hands started to shake. And I started to doubt. And I'm like, what is going to happen here? And all of that played together to where I couldn't climb anymore and my hands just said you're done climbing right now and I fell and in this split second of me falling as I felt you know what went through my mind right like the earlier from 10 feet I'm much higher than 10 feet now and I fall and I let out a squeal that a lot of the 8 to 10 year old girls down here could identify with in a moment I went ah! and then it boom it caught me ah! good we're good nothing to see here I did that on purpose you see I told you it'd work we're fine right like, for a lot of us, that's our trust in God, right? That's our, we're clinging to the wall. We're holding onto the wall. We're like, I can do this on my own. I don't know if I can trust God. I've never really trusted God with anything before. Can I really trust God? Like, oh, I'm not sure. And every time you let go, every time you let go, he catches you. Every time you let go, he, you trust him. And I learned a little lesson about trust in that moment. It says, trust in the Lord and, and do good. You see, I could have climbed that wall. Why do I know that I could have climbed that wall? Because I came back down, I unhooked, and I went over, and a 10-year-old girl walked up, put that thing on, and went right up that wall with no problems and no squealing. I felt ashamed of myself that day and walked away a little bit lesser of a man. But I learned a good lesson. But if I had focused on the trust, if I had known what I was trusting in and just focused on the climb... It wasn't even that hard. I'd done that stuff tons of times before, but I hadn't done it in a long time. It was something new, and I didn't know if I could trust it, and all of that worked together, and I didn't trust. But how many of us, that's our walk with God, trust in the Lord and do good. Then he says, delight yourself. Delight yourself in the Lord. There are a lot of sourpuss Christians around, right? Mm. I really love God. You can't tell it by looking at my face, right? They drank too many lemonade without sugar. Like there's far too many Christians with far too little delight in the Lord. Delight in the Lord changes our affections. We're talking about redirecting our affections. I will tell you, 20 years ago, my affections got directed in one direction. 
as my wife walked down the aisle on our wedding day, all of my affections and all of my delight got directed right at her. Rye, I'm sorry you're sitting right in front of me. I know it's awkward for me too. But all of my affections got directed right toward my wife. And I redirected my affections and it changed my life. Delighting in the Lord is more than just this white-knuckled experience of obedience. Delighting in the Lord means joy. Delighting in the Lord is about love. It's about those types of feelings. The longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119, is all about the Word of God and talks about the laws and statutes and obeying and all this kind of stuff. And over and over and over again, it says, I delight in your Word. I delight in your law. I delight in obedience to your statutes. That there is delight in the Christian life. That if we're redirecting our affections toward the Lord, people should see it on our face. If we're redirecting our affections, if we really love the Lord, and we're not just walking through the Christian life with white-knuckled obedience, there's going to be some, some delight. And what I want you to see is, like, we look at the delights, quote, the delights of the world, and get our gaze fixed on that, and it never delivers But when we turn our gaze and we direct our affections and direct our delight and ask for God to give us delight, that changes our life. He says, commit your way to the Lord. The idea of commit there is an interesting one because it means to take a burden and roll it off onto another person. To commit, to give it to them. When I was in college, we did a a canoe um, backpacking trip where we would canoe and then we had to get out of the lake and we had to portage the canoes, which means that somebody had to take this aluminum canoe and put it on their back and carry it to the next lake and then put it in. And we worked in teams and one of the things that we would often do is a guy would be carrying this heavy canoe for a while and then the burden was, was heavy and so you would roll it off and then the other guy would be right there and he would roll it up onto himself and he would walk with the canoe a while and you worked in tandem and did it together like that. When we commit our way to the Lord, we're entrusting him to carry our burdens in life. And then he says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Uh, some of your translations say rest and the idea is like that there's a calm surrender And then when we're following the Lord, there's a calm surrender. And I don't know if you've ever been swimming in like a moving body of water, the ocean or a river or something like that. But one of the things that you'll find is is as you've done that, that if you fight against the current, whatever the current is, you're going nowhere, right? But there are times and opportunities, and we've had these at camps and things like that, where it is a beautiful thing just to let the current take you where it's taking you and to enjoy an amazing, restful, peaceful uh, experience and excursion. That's the idea of resting in the Lord and the idea that he talks about of of having that calm surrender. So when I'm looking at good things happening to bad people, where are my affections? Like, where are, are my loves? And look at the second half of each of those verses quickly, too, because the second half actually shows the results. Trust in the Lord and do good, verse 3. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. That means to, to cultivate faithfulness. So as I'm directing my trust to God, then I can be faithful and and I can focus on faithfulness as opposed to focusing all the things that the world has around me. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you whatever you want. Guys, this is an amazing verse. If you just delight in God, he'll give you everything you want. Did you know that? Ask him for anything you want and he'll give it to you as long as you're delighting. And if he's making you happy and you're delighting in him, then he'll just keep giving you things. You see how it's like this, this... circular relationship. The more God makes you happy, the more you love him, the more he makes you happy. Isn't that amazing? Does anybody have firewood? That's called heresy, right? That's called the prosperity gospel. What this verse means is, is as I delight in him, my desires become his desires. What he wants becomes what I want. Rather than looking at everything else that everyone's looking at to make them happy and make them prosperous and make them successful, it actually starts to completely change the way that I even understand prosperity. Because God gets to define prosperity. God gets to redefine my life. God gets to redefine my values. God gets to redefine my priorities and my purpose and my identity and all those things. That my whole job is just delight in Him. And then He will change my heart accordingly. 
Like, that's what we need, is we need to, God to continue to redefine our lives and, and change our lives in that way. Commit to the Lord, trust in Him, and He will act. It says He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. He's talking about vindication there, that God will be your vindication. I would submit to you that one of the reasons that we get mad when good things happen to bad people or we get jealous when good things happen to, to bad people is because we're frustrated or we're upset that we're not getting those same things, right? And, and, and we get upset or frustrated or, or jealous that that person looks better than me or that person's getting more than I am. And what does that say about me? And then we have to go and revenge buy or revenge post or revenge whatever to vindicate ourselves, right? And as I've said before, you know we've all bought things that we didn't want with money that we don't have to impress people we don't like. That's called revenge buying, right? Or revenge posting, or however it is that it works for you. Uh, but that's one of the things that the text says, that when God is my vindication, it gives me the freedom to give all that up. You know that? That there's a way for me to not be jealous that somebody else has something that I don't. That somebody else is getting away with something that they shouldn't get away with. And that's to entrust my vindication to God. But I don't have to go after it for myself. I don't have to get it all for myself. That I can entrust God with it. Be still before the Lord. Wait patiently. Here comes that fret piece again. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. I don't have to let my emotions get the best of me. When I watch things that make me mad, when I see things that make me jealous when I see good things happening to bad people, I don't have to let my emotions get the best of me. I can respond properly. The next verses, verses 8 through 11, say that as I do that, then I can pe prepare to experience true prosperity. Verse 8, refrain from anger and forsake wrath. He'll come back to that again. Fret not yourself. Do you know why? Because it tends only to evil. Because our response when good things happen to bad people can turn us into bad people. Right? Your response, my response, when I see good things happening to bad people, if it causes unrighteous anger, if it causes me to get jealous and, and turn away from God and turn away from faith, like our response can cause us to turn into bad people. He says, evildoers shall be cut off. Those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. That phrase will come up again, and I'll explain it. But verse 10, it says, in just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Does it feel like that, though? In just a little while? By the way, this was written about 3,000 years ago. Does it feel like in just a little while, the wicked will be no more? No, it seems like they're just prospering, and it's becoming more, and it's getting worse. And can I tell you something? According to my theology, it's going to get worse before it gets better, right? Like, it's going to seem like that more and more. If you're frustrated or tired of, of it seeming like good things are happening to bad people now, like, just wait, right? That's why this perspective is so important. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. Verse 11, but the meek shall inherit the land. You heard that before? Seems like a famous guy said that in a real famous sermon. You're like, Billy Graham said that? No, Jesus actually did in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Matthew 5, 5, Jesus says that the meek shall inherit the earth. And what this is, and he's actually said it three times if you've picked it up in Psalm 37. In these 11 verses, he's talked about inheriting the land or dwelling in the land. This is a covenantal promise that God is talking about with his people, that the people of God in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel, were going to dwell in the land that God had given them. And in fact, they did. But what he's talking about here, and then in the, end, the rest of the verse, the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. What he's talking about here is true prosperity. In Matthew, in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed means that God looks upon you and smiles. It's true happiness. What he's talking about here with this inheriting the land and abundant peace is this, is that the blessing that you really want only comes from God. 
that the prosperity that we're really looking for only comes from God. So here's what happens. I pick up social media. I pick up my news app. I look out the window at a neighbor. I see a friend. I'm at work, whatever it is, and I see good things happening to bad people. I see a version of prosperity. And that prosperity either angers me or it makes me jealous. I only see one version of prosperity. And it's not the true version of prosperity. It's not the prosperity that God talks about in His Word. Because true prosperity is His last two words, abundant peace. There are many of you in this room, as there were in the first service, who are going through deep, dark, and difficult things. Prosperity theology doesn't offer you a whole lot. Secular prosperity offers you very little, but biblical prosperity offers you abundant peace. There are some of you in this room that have relationships that are just messed up with family members, kids, other people. Prosperity gospel of health and wealth and just claim it offers you very little. Secular prosperity offers you maybe a way of temporary escape. But what God offers you is abundant peace. And for us who are Christians and us who stand on this side of the cross and this side of history, we know that abundant peace only comes through one person, and that's Jesus Christ. Romans talks about the fact that we have peace with God. Since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Like, that's the peace that you're shooting for. If you're not a Christian... Like, I want you to experience real prosperity. I want you to experience some, like, fake, truncated, cotton candy prosperity. I want you to experience real prosperity. And I want you to experience abundant peace. And that comes through trusting Christ as your Savior. Admitting that you're a sinner, your sins separate you from God, and that Christ died in your place for your sins so that you can have peace with God. Become a Christian and start to pursue real prosperity. If you're already a Christian, you're here this morning and you need some encouragement, I want to encourage you with this, that, that prosperity, secular prosperity, may look good for a moment, but there is abundant p- peace which is possible. And how we respond when good things happen to bad people says a lot about our faith. So to close this this morning, I'm going to ask you actually to, to bow your heads and close your eyes, and close up your Bibles, your phones, whatever it is, and take a moment, bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're new, I assure you, no one's coming to rob you at this moment. I just want to give you a minute to think and, and to hear some words that I'm going to read. And, and without distraction, I just want you to be able to hear these words. So we've been in Psalm 37. If you invert those numbers, it's interesting because Psalm 73 is actually a whole psalm that speaks about exactly what we've been talking about when good things happen to bad people. I'm just going to read those words for you and then close us in prayer. I'm not going to uh, comment on them at all, but I just want you to sit and listen to God's Word uh, and what it has to say, and, and I pray that it'll resonate with you as we close this morning. Psalm 73, as your heads are bowed and eyes are closed. The Psalm of Asaph. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, My feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death, their bodies are fat and sleek, they are not in trouble as others are, they're not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore pride is their necklace, violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness, their hearts overflow with follies, they scoff and speak with malice, loftily they threaten oppression." They set their mouths against the heavens. Their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked. Always at ease, they increase in riches. All in vain, I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long, I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. Until. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. 
Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes. O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and arrogant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? There is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Please stand with me and close in prayer. Father, we praise you this morning for your goodness, for your faithfulness to us. We thank you that you give us a definition and an understanding of what prosperity looks like that is far greater and far exceeds anything that the world could show us. Yet, God, I stand before you on behalf of these people and acknowledge that that is very difficult at times, that as we see what so many times seems like the wicked prospering, like sin winning, that it's difficult. And for some, it leads us to unrighteous anger. And for others, it leads us to jealousy. Or maybe it leads us to a little bit of both. So God, I pray that today would have been an opportunity for us to see that junk as what it is. To see it as fading and withering. To see abundant peace as true prosperity. And God, that we would just pursue you and pursue that. And God, as we see those things happening, we do pray that you would help us to keep our emotions in check and Keep us from freaking out. God, help us to continue to just take the long view and, and continue to direct our affections toward you. God, if there's a person here today who doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, I pray that you would continue to work on their heart, call them to yourself, so that they'd be able to experience abundant peace and true prosperity as well. Um, equip us to continue to serve you better as we walk out of here and as we go throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys, thanks for being here this morning. Again, if there's uh, anything we can help you with, there's a QR code right in front of you. Um, hit that. That will also help everybody, all of you know uh, things that are happening this week. Thank you.